Today's video is sponsored by Aura. So a couple of months ago, I got an email that really caught me off guard. It had my legal name, address, and was claiming that whoever sent it had been spying on me through my devices. Of course, I was just about ready to freak out, but then I checked Reddit and realized that it was an attempted scam and had been sent to thousands of other people in the exact same format. As it turns out, these scammers don't actually spy on people, but rather claim that they do in order to blackmail individuals for money. Now, we all know that data breaches happen, but how do we know when and where our information was leaked? You could manually check, but what if you miss the memo? After all, who can keep up with all that? Especially with breaches like Dell's, which expose 3.9 million records, or Ticketmaster's, which compromised 560 million. And then there's the worst one, National Public Data, where 2.9 billion records, including social security numbers, were leaked. Well, all of that is why you use today's sponsor, Aura. Aura monitors your personal data across billions of sources, including the dark web, and alerts you if any of your information is compromised. It keeps everything neat, tidy, and in one central location so you don't miss a thing. They even offer up to 5 million in identity theft insurance and a bunch of other tools like a VPN and password manager to help keep you safe. Don't wait until it's too late. Go to Aura.com slash Rainbot and try two weeks for free to see if your personal data has been exposed. Again, that's Aura.com slash Rainbot for two weeks of Aura absolutely free. So I finally got to watch the prequel to Psycho the Large Family and wanted to discuss it with you all here today, just in time for peak spooky season. Quick disclaimer, if you haven't watched my first video, then I highly suggest that you watch that first because while what we're discussing here today did come out first, I outlined a bunch of key observations as well as theories that I feel would kind of come out of nowhere in this video unless you've already got necessary context. Really, this prequel is kind of just half the story. In fact, I say prequel, but in reality, this piece of 2003 media called The Cursed Large Family isn't technically a full-on movie, but rather a 45-minute episode or short film in an anthology called Banned from Broadcast. I believe there are about seven or so episodes, all with their own unique topics, and what would later be known as Psycho the Large Family in 2009 is actually more of a feature-length spin-off sequel to that one episode. I believe a couple of other episodes also got their own feature-length continuations, but as far as the story of the Ura family goes, it's now looking that these are the only two times that they've made on-screen appearances. I previously thought that maybe this was a trilogy situation, but that's no longer seeming to be the case, unfortunately. But anyway, back to the topic of the Cursed Large Family. I did mention its existence briefly at the end of my first video, but at that point I hadn't actually watched it yet since I wanted to keep my opinions and analysis contained. What I will say right off the bat is that after watching this first short film, a number of things have been recontextualized, at least in my eyes, and I managed to stumble upon a fair bit of interesting information, in particular in regards to that ghost photograph, which actually exists in real life, but more on that later. One more thing that I really quickly wanted to say before we jump into this is that the Cursed Large Family is entirely in Japanese. Now in Psycho, as you guys know if you've watched the first video, most things are in English, like the framing of it is entirely in English because of Veronica Addison, but in this first visit with the Ura family, the documentary crew within the narrative are fellow natives to the country. Now this obviously sucks for all the English speakers out there, and while there are AI subtitled versions on YouTube, I am of the opinion that these aren't exactly great. For example, I found one version, and while skipping to a random part, I noticed that while they were talking about the Tori gate in the ghost photo, the subtitles actually translated Tori to bird, which kind of makes sense since the two words sound similar when spoken, but it's unfortunate because the AI couldn't tell the difference. Um, I'm guessing to people completely unfamiliar with Japanese, errors like this throughout the 45 minute runtime could be frustrating and confusing, like to the point of maybe not wanting to watch it, but all that said, if you feel like chancing it through the AI translations, then power to you, of course. You can probably piece things together fairly well. Either way, I'll be discussing the events of the Cursed Large Family here today, and as such, spoilers, of course, are incoming. So the film opens up with the Ura family in a very familiar scene. During their morning radio workouts, this time led by their biological father, Keichiro Ura. Text on screen explains that filming for this particular documentary commenced in May of 2002. After exercise, the family gathers for breakfast, and we see younger versions of all the same characters as before. Ringo and Goki are of course present this time around, a stark contrast to how we find them in the sequel. Mom is introduced, looking basically identical to how we'd see her in 2009, and we also find Mikan making food just like before. Interviewers do ask what she's making, and of course, it's that same meat dish that we see later in Psycho, just like we talked about this beef dish is for dads only, at least in the Ura household. Now, very important, Enrique the cat is alive, floofy, but is unfortunately getting fed that mystery meat, and it's sad, but we all know that this cat doesn't have much time left on Earth. 
Next, Father Keichiro is introduced, and this man who was reduced to nothing but a photo for the longest time for me is suddenly smiling and talking about how the family is always together. Through narration, we learn that Dad is, or rather was, a carpenter. He was successful in his trade up until a couple of years ago when he fell off a ladder in a workplace accident, this resulting in an injury that left him unable to work. Now, the crew pan over to Mom, noting that it must be hard raising such a large family without a solid income. Mom adds that she's been working part-time to help everyone scrape by while Dad Dad takes time to recover. Dad seems optimistic, all things considered, insisting that the family can overcome anything and everything so long as they have each other's backs. Based on everything I just said, this iteration of the Ura family really does seem perfect so far, and it kind of makes you wonder where everything went wrong. That kind of gets hinted at immediately, because as we all know, nothing ever lasts when we're talking about these people. By 8am, everyone is out the door, either for work or school, all except for Dad, of course, who stays back. We cut immediately, though, to later in the day. The camera operator is now walking down the hallway towards the sound of a crying child. It's done. This time, a much younger version from the one we'd later see in 2009. He's crying and holding his head for whatever reason. Dad comes to his aid, chimes in, and tells us that Don was playing and somehow managed to fall when he looked away for a split second. After this, we cut over to 6.30 p.m., where the family is now having dinner. Here, the narrator explains that it's not just Don who had been hurt recently, that other Ura family members have also sustained injuries somehow. Mom mentions Ramon, one of the middle children, recently getting hurt, and that her eye had swelled up as a result. Dad chimes Chimes in again, going, You fell down and got hurt, didn't you, Remon? The narrator continues, revealing to us that these injuries had mom stressed out, and not just for the obvious reasons, but rather they were dredging up painful memories. Of course, based on what we saw in the sequel movie, we know immediately what they're referring to here is the death of Takaharu. This time, though, we get a little more information about what exactly happened to this boy. The parents explain that Takaharu had been gone for about a year at that point, which would mean that he passed away in 2001. They reveal that the boy hadn't returned from school one day, and shortly thereafter was discovered by police to have accidentally drowned in a nearby river. Mom continues the conversation, outlining the grim totality of it all. Her son's death, the bizarre freak accidents her family seems to endure. Now, to top this all off, the narrator tells us that Dad had been feeling even worse lately, and as a result had become bedridden. This, of course, only prolonging his absence from work. 12.35 a.m. The children are now asleep, except for one, Ringo who is hard at work studying for her exams. When asked what she plans to study in college, she mentions wanting to enter a pharmacy program. And when asked why, she explains that her mother was a nurse, but also tells us that it's because she wants to find a way to make her father's life easier. The scene then cuts to outside the home, where it's revealed that another Ura family member is awake. Goki, who once aspired to be a professional baseball player, is practicing his swing. The next day arrives, and the Uras are up to their usual morning routine. Ringo, however, is curiously absent. We cut to the dining room, where the family gathers for breakfast. Ringo arrives, albeit late, and though the family resumes eating as usual, father starts asking why she's late. Ringo explains that she was up all night studying, to which Keichiro initially responds calmly, even advising her to not push herself too hard. He smiles, and their conversation seems pleasant enough, until, without warning, he explodes in anger, hurling his bowls across the room and accosting Ringo. This violent outburst mirrors a later confrontation between Rie and her eventual stepfather from the sequel, except now these roles are reversed. When Keichiro and Ringo return to the table, it's as if nothing happened. Ringo quietly holds her hand to her face, and Mikan offers her a tissue. An awkward silence fills the room as the family resumes their meal. Despite the outburst, Keichiro continues talking about how much he loves having the family together. Honestly, he's kind of a broken record at this point. After the meal, once the family has dispersed, the camera crew approaches Tsukasa as she's cleaning up. Through tears, she tells us that she believes Keichiro's outburst was triggered by Ringo's absence from their morning exercise and her being late to breakfast. She also suspects that Keichiro is bitter over his injury and his inability to work. In other words, he's projecting really hard. The crew confronts Keichiro directly. He repeats that he believes that family should stick together. When asked if he thought his actions were too harsh, he smiles and simply says, 
Daijobu des when it is very much not Daijobu des. A few days later, the crew returns to the Ura household. The narrator explains that they may have stumbled upon the root cause of the family's misfortunes. Inside, Tsukasa is seen sitting with Ryuta, sternly questioning him about a photograph he's holding, and tells him to throw it away. When Ryuta leaves, the crew asks him about the photo. It turns out to be the cursed Tori photo that was featured in the later movie. Tsukasa explains that their nightmare with the photo began two years ago when it mysteriously appeared in their mailbox. Though they threw it away, it kept somehow reappearing. The last time it resurfaced, their son Takaharu found it. Four days later, Takaharu, as we all know, tragically passed away. The camera crew asks Tsukasa if she recognizes anything in the photo, to which she replies that there's nothing in it like anything in their neighborhood. Before the conversation can continue, a loud sound echoes from another room. <laughs> The family rushes over to find Rie lying at the bottom of a staircase with Keichiro close behind. Rie is taken to a hospital but is quickly discharged. Back at home, Sukasa and Keichiro explain that Rie sustained a mild concussion. Keichiro mentions that the girl must have slipped, which seems to happen a lot when he's left alone with his kids. Four days later, the crew returns to the Ura household. Some of the younger children are found drawing on the floor. Remon is drawing her family, but the crew notice that dad has been left out for some reason. When asked about it, she says, quote, because he'll be gone soon. And when asked what she even means, she simply says, secret. Don is also present, and it's revealed that he's somehow found another iteration of the cursed photo, which he's now putting to paper. The child tells the crew that he picked it up just outside somewhere, which shouldn't be possible since the last one we saw was supposedly destroyed. In the next scene, a woman arrives at the Aura household, welcomed in by mom, and good news, she's both a psychic medium and exorcist. Placing her palm over the photo, she declares it powerful and warns that if something isn't done soon, more tragedies are bound to follow. Later, Tsukasa explains to Keichiro that the psychic came and recommended an exorcism. Dad protests, citing the high cost of such ceremonies. A data slide reveals that exorcisms can cost thousands of dollars, though some practitioners choose not to charge a fee. Tsukasa insists that they must proceed, pleading with her husband to not let another tragedy like Takaharu's death happen again. Dad, true to form, throws a tantrum and storms out. Three days later, the Ura family huddles together for the exorcism. However, Dad, for whatever reason, it's never explained, is notably absent. The psychic begins chanting, explaining that the photo has turned into a portal, allowing evil spirits to infiltrate the home. そして、As the exorcism progresses, Ringo appears increasingly uncomfortable and suddenly bursts into wailing before ultimately collapsing. After three long hours, the ceremony concludes. The psychic burns the cursed photograph, declaring the exorcism a success. Tsukasa is relieved, and Ringo, still groggy, tells the crew she feels tired but can't remember what happened. The psychic expresses concern over Keichiro's absence, suggesting that it may have lessened the efficacy of the ritual. 
One week later, the Ura family is seen going about their usual routine. Keichiro is shown sitting in the hallway playing with Enrique the cat. He mentions feeling better and hopes that if things continue improving that he'll be able to return to work sooner than later. As breakfast is prepared, the girls add extra seasoning to Keichiro's beef, and the cat, once again, manages to sneak some of it. Don expresses his desire to have some of the meat as well, but Tsukasa adamantly refuses, quickly scooping him up and insisting that he shouldn't have meat in the morning. Now, Keichiro looks confused, but doesn't question her decision, for once, and the children silently watch as he eats the remaining beef. Cut to home video footage shows the family enjoying a picnic over the weekend, which would seem to be a happy moment if not for the fact that the narrator then mentions this is the last time the family would ever be whole. Ten days later, the crew returns to the Ura household to find out that Keichiro has gone missing. It's been five days since anyone has seen him. Tsukasa even explains that she had called around but so far has zero answers. She retrieves something from a shelf behind her, the cursed photograph, which has inexplicably resurfaced yet again. Now, this despite the fact that we watched it burn just a couple of scenes ago. The narrator tells us that after this, a police report was filed, but Keichiro was ultimately never found. Determined to find answers, the film crew takes the cursed photo to the president of a local psychics association. The expert examines the photo and confirms that it is haunted by malevolent spirits. When told about the Ura family and their missing father, the psychic pauses and asks if Keichiro might actually just be dead. Looking closely at the photo, the psychic counts six figures and suggests that Keichiro may be trapped within the image. One month later, the Uras continue their morning routine, just without their dad this time. They seem happier, and the string of injuries has even stopped. The camera pans to the garden, where freshly disturbed soil marks the grave of Enrique, the cat, who has mysteriously, or not so mysteriously, passed away. As the family exercises outside, the camera crew wanders the halls of the house, eventually arriving in the children's bedroom. Multiple drawings are scattered across the floor. The camera zooms in on them, then returns outside for one final image of Enrique's grave. The scene then cuts to a wide shot of the cityscape, as text appears to ask us, Did you see the truth? So, what is the truth exactly? Interestingly, while this movie, much like its sequel, still remains more ambiguous than traditional films, it does offer some clarity towards the end, assuming, of course, that we take these revelations at face value. Again, at the conclusion, we see the camera crew shifting from the contented Uro family outside to the children's room, where they zoom in on several drawings. These drawings, being created by children, might not be entirely reliable, but what they supposedly depict is shocking. Now, really quickly, I want to give a huge thank you to my friend Kai for helping me with the translations for these since I was having a hell of a time trying to read this chicken scratch. Some of you probably already know him from TikTok or YouTube, but if not and you're into Japan-centered content, definitely check him out and let him know that I sent you. But anyway, one of the images shown shows the mother and one of the sisters, likely Ringo, placing poison into the food confirming our suspicions. This is also hinted at when Ringo mentions wanting to go into pharmacy for school and how mom was at one point a nurse. It helps shed some light on how these people may have had the knowledge and resources to pull off such a plan, especially since Mikan wouldn't become a nurse herself until several years later in the sequel. The next few drawings are even more incriminating, believe it or not. One shows the mother with multiple copies of the infamous ghost photo, with text stating that there aren't actually any ghosts. Speaking of the cursed photograph, which has been central to both of the films, it's worth exploring what this image really represents. Now, for those unaware, Tori gates are typically found near shrines and sacred places and often carry an otherworldly atmosphere to them. The film briefly mentions that this image had been shown on TV before, which turns out to be true in real life. The photo was featured on a Japanese TV show called Unbelievable, which comes across a lot like the OG Unsolved Mysteries, if I had to compare it to anything. And again, the Curse Arch family was on one episode of an anthology 
anthology called Banned from Broadcast, which aired on Fuji TV, the same network responsible for Unbelievable. In one episode, they tell the story of a woman who went missing after encountering this particular Tory Gate image. The segment involves the usual elements like a psychic and reenactments, which were standard for TV shows of this genre at the time, of course. But where it gets interesting, people eventually discover the real source of this photo. According to this blog, the images were part of a series of fake ghost photos that you could get from a gachapon type vending machine. It seems the Ura mother got her hands on several of these fake ghost photos, perhaps after seeing them on TV, or she had copies made. Either way, one of her children witnessed her with multiple versions, ready to plant them whenever one was lost or destroyed. Now, another drawing depicts Goki hitting their father, followed by two of the most telling images, at least in my opinion. One shows the mother pushing a ladder while father was on it, presumably causing the so-called workplace accident. The next shows the father pushing someone into a river answering a question I've had ever since first watching Psycho the Large Family. The responsibility for Takaharu's death rests on none other than Keiichiro, the family's biological father. So, given all this, here's my interpretation of things. The head of the Ura family is, quite frankly, a terrible fucking person. He's prone to violent outbursts, particularly towards Ringo, which casts her earlier fondness for him in Psycho the Large Family in a new, unsettling light. What was Keiichiro like? She's lying to the camera, pretending that he was a good father. During Dad's outbursts, Mom appears utterly defeated and who could blame her? The children are getting hurt, everyone's walking on eggshells. You can't really blame her for wanting out of the situation. Viewing things this way puts Tsukasa, the mother, in a different light. If we accept this version of events, she's not just after insurance money, she's a desperate mother trying to save her children from a terrible man. This also makes it even more tragic when, in the next film, she becomes what she fought to protect her family from. It's hard to pinpoint why she changed, but trauma often perpetuates a vicious cycle. I will say one thing that I am still extremely unclear on is how exactly this man died. Did Goki use a bat or was it the poison? Both seem to be presented, but it's not ultimately clear what happened the day of Keichiro's death. It seems like mom did try to get rid of her husband before all this, when she pushed the ladder again in that so-called work accident, but for one reason or another, that attempt was unsuccessful. The actions of the first Ura father also reframe the ending of the stepfather's eventual story. The children saving him from their mother was clearly the good ending, even without watching this prequel, but knowing their past makes it even more satisfying, at least for me. They went from an abusive father father to a genuinely caring one, which feels like the best possible outcome for this dysfunctional group. Now, again, having said all this, and again, with the Uras, nothing is ever just good or happy. One lingering question is remaining for me. During the Curse Large Family, the mother claims that a copy of the ghost photograph appeared before Takaharu drowned, again, about four days before. I don't know what to make of this. If we believe that the mother had multiple copies of the cursed image and she alone had these things, could she have been involved in Takaharu's death? Is all of this misleading? If so, this would suggest that she's always been unhinged all along, that maybe there was always something more sinister about her independent of her husband. After all, by the second movie, she's the prime suspect behind her children's injuries. In the end, there's really no concrete answers and this is gonna keep me awake at night. Once again, I really do appreciate though how these Ura family films leave certain elements unexplained, allowing room for interpretation. While more is clarified in this installment, I feel much is still left open-ended, adding to the eerie atmosphere of family dysfunction and hidden secrets. In conclusion, I don't have all the answers and I'm actually kind of okay with that. It seems we've reached the end of the Ura family saga, which is unfortunate because I really want to keep digging for answers, but at this point I would love to see other interpretations of the story, maybe even from someone fluent in Japanese, since I was bound to miss one thing or another. If you guys want me to explore similar movies, media, etc. just like this, then feel free to let me know. Probably on Instagram or something, because at this point I honestly don't use Twitter. And with all that said, happy Halloween and I'll see you all soon.